The House of Roll journeys far and wide to bring you exceptional quality kitchen and bath fixtures. In all of this, you'll see the details of your own story. The story of a life well-crafted. Welcome to the House of Roll. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast, episode number 44. Don't be pushed around by the fears in your mind. Be led by the dreams in your heart. Roy Bennett. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft, it's the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. And today's show is also sponsored by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. If you want access to filmmaking documentaries, feature films about filmmaking, interviews with some of the top screenwriters and filmmakers in Hollywood, as well as educational online courses all in one place, IFH TV is for you. Just head over to IndieFilmHustle.tv. Now, today is a special crossover event between the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast and the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. On the show, we have returning champion and legend in the screenwriting field, Linda Seeger. Linda is the author of the best-selling, game-changing book, Making a Good Script Great. Some of her other titles are Writing for Subtext, Creating Unforgettable Characters, Making a Good Writer Great, Advanced Screenwriting, The Art of Adapting, Turning Fact and Fiction into Film, just to name a few. And her brand new book is called The Collaborative Art of Filmmaking from Script to Screen. In that book, she interviews over 80 well-known artists, directors, producers, writers, editors, composers, production designers, and see how they work together to make some of the greatest films of all time. Now, I love Linda. She has been on. She was one of my early, early original guests on the Indie Film Hustle podcast show and an early guest on the Bulletproof Screenplay podcast. But I wanted to have her back because I wanted not only to talk about her new book, but really go into the weeds on making a good script great and what it takes to be a screenwriter in today's world. And just talking to her, you know, Linda is a wealth, a wealth, a wealth of information. She really is truly a national treasure when it comes to screenwriting. She not only works with Oscar-winning directors and writers and producers, but she also works with the little guy, the, the one screenwriter who's just starting up with an idea. She works with everybody and everybody from the beginner to the professional and everyone in between. And she has such amazing insight and stories about that process, about creating good scripts, things that actually sell in the marketplace and honing in on that idea, the idea that you might be bringing to her. She's there to really kind of help you chisel it and define what you're trying to do. So I had an absolute ball talking to to Linda. This is a fairly epic episode. It's over an hour and change. And uh, she just kept talking and talking, and I seriously could have kept talking to her for hours. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Linda Seeger. I'd like to welcome back to the show returning champion, Linda Seeger. Thank you so much for being on the show, Linda. Oh, thank you. You have been, you were one of my early, uh, ep- one of my early episodes and one of my early interviews and you're, uh, how to make a good script great. And you honestly were, uh, one of the most popular podcasts I had on both of my podcasts. And, uh, for everyone that, li- everyone who's listening, who doesn't know who Linda is or her work, she is a legend. She has been, uh, she was like one of the first, if not the first. Yeah, kind of I was sc- the first. Yes. 
So you actually started the whole consulting, helping screenwriters write. I started the script consulting business and I started it as I was the first one to think of it as an entrepreneurial business as opposed to somebody teaching a class and helping people with their scripts. So t- so tell a little bit about tell everybody a little bit about your background if they don't know who you are. Well, I have a, a big background in drama. I have a master's. I have a doctorate in a very unusual field of drama and theology, if you can figure that out. <laughs> and I've taught college. I've directed plays. And I did a thesis for my doctoral degree on what makes a script work or what makes a great script. And when I entered the film industry in 1980, I found a whole lot of scripts that didn't work. And I took my thesis and I applied it to those scripts to figure out what's missing. And it was very workable. I I started out very slowly, went to a career consultant, said, this is really what I want to do. So I've been doing this since 1981. Really still enjoy doing it. I work with a whole huge breadth of writers. I work with people who say I have an idea, and I work with Academy Award winners and just about everybody in between. Now, I want to. I want. I've always been curious about this because I've had like your friend Michael Haig on and Chris Vogler and a lot of these guys um, who are in the space with you, and they also work with like you know starting out and and then they also work with these big oscar winning how is the conversation like when you have an oscar winning screenwriter who's obviously very capable and very seasoned what is the conversation like that too like when they call you for help where's their block what's what's stopping them from writing something sometimes the problem is that it's simply not selling and they're wondering if there's something wrong that they are not seeing because no one is very objective about their own work you need a professional outside eye but what i notice with the experienced writers very re- i'm very respectful and i'm very careful and i don't have to say as much so i might just say okay let's look at this first turning point Um, It's a little muddy. Could it be just a little cleaner to really get that narrative track in the second act going? And they nod. And I, I don't have to say more because I don't have to explain it. They know exactly what I'm saying. So there's a shortcut and there's a kind of a trust that is there that, okay, I say those three sentences and next point. And, um, and most of the time, Experienced people are also very respectful of me. And there is that mutual sense you're both doing a professional job. Now, I do have experienced writers who say, never tell anyone who worked with me that I call you in on my scripts because I'm a professional. <laughs> right. And I think other people really don't mind. Like I worked with William Kelly, who wrote Witness After Witness. And I think we actually worked on two scripts. So they, they didn't get made. Um, and I think the producers had an idea that was kind of unworkable no matter what you did with it. Mm-hmm. But it, it was great to work with him and to know him. That's that's amazing. Yeah, because I, I, I know a lot of times um, the screenwriters, especially when they get up up and up at the es- upper echelons of the business where their names are now famous or, or known in the industry at least – uh, they don't want to know that they don't want to let anyone know that like I have a secret weapon like Linda uh, yes. that I go to yes. <laughs> for for yeah. advice. Yeah, and other people are actually very pleased about that and say, sure. "Oh, that's that's fine." And in fact, when I started out in 1980 and 81, I was a secret from everyone, and nobody would admit it. Now, what happens is a lot of people consider it sort of a badge of honor and professionalism like of course i go to a script consultant to make sh- get that last 5 or 10 or 20% out of my script like no problem that's amazing because i mean and because a lot of times screenwriters uh, especially young screenwriters uh, they just they don't they don't think screen consultants can bring a lot of value to them because they're like oh if if they can do like if they if they're that good why haven't they won ten Oscars and things like yes. that and it's it's kind of 
I, I've always looked at it as like you're looking at a you're like a technician. You're gonna come in and do things and see things that they just are not gonna see, no matter how talented they might be. Mm. Michael Jordan had a coach. I mean, and he was one yes. of the greatest basketball players of all time. Well, the other thing is consulting is a totally different talent than mm-hmm. screenwriting. And you have to be diplomatic, you have to be very good at explaining concepts. So, um, you know, when people say, well, you don't write, I say, no, I'm not interested in writing, I'm interested in consulting, because that's where my ability and that's where my background is. And consulting is a combination of analytical and creative, because I have to get inside that other person's story and their style. And when I give notes, I have to, if it's a comedy, I have to give com- comedy notes, not just Ooh. You know, notes. Um, And I'm there to help them work and nurture their own talent and their particular abilities. So um, it's it suits me very, very well. And there's just a lot of people who say, I just don't want to do that. I really want to write. And so that's great. (laughs) That's what you should be doing. We need writers. Now, your new book, uh, well, one of the many, I mean, you've written like 13 or or 5,000 books. Well, I've written over 15, but nine on screenwriting, and I'm writing my 10th on screenwriting right now. Right. And you've, and you've written, so you're very prolific as a writer. I don't know what you're saying. You don't like to write, but you do write, you write, you write, well, the, no, these kind write. Of books. Yeah. you write these books, you write a lot of books, but um, your latest book is the collaborative of yes. art of filmmaking, of the art of filmmaking from script to screen. Yes. Push yes, the book out there. there. Absolutely. So I wanted to ask you, what are some of the necessary elements that make a successful creative calib- uh, um, collaboration? Well, the first thing is that film used to be think thought of as the director is the true artist. So mm-hmm. it was called the auteur theory. And somewhere in the 80s, maybe even into the 90s, people began to think differently about making a film. They said, this is a collaboration between the greatest artists in each of their areas. I mean, imagine working with the greatest composers, the greatest makeup artists, the greatest actors, the greatest directors, and what a thrill that is when you think of how much they bring because they are masters at what they do. So the collaborative art of filmmaking follows the script from the script stage through every artist to look at what does each artist do along the way to create the film. And the script is really sometimes thought of as a guide or a blueprint. It's it's one of the few art forms that is not complete when you do it. It's not complete <laughs> until all these different artists come in and do this great work with it. Now, what we did, the the first two editions were done with, uh, I had a co-author, Ed Wetmore, who actually died in 2016, but gave me permission before that to do the third edition by myself. When we first did this, we interviewed 70 different artists, and then we've added interviews, and in this one, the third edition, I've added some more and also did a lot of Google (laughs) research as well. Um, (laughs) Now, and it isn't really exactly an interview book. What it is is that all these different artists talk about ideas so that, so I will discuss an idea. Let's, let's just talk about what a composer does. And then there might be a series of quotes from famous composers that expand the idea that I have introduced. So, um, and then there's a case study and we decided to keep the same case study as the second edition, which is A Beautiful Mind, um, just because it's it's a great film, mm-hmm. and it's really, really difficult to talk to every artist on a film, and that was the whole idea of a case study. So the first edition, the case study was Dead Poet Society, and some of those quotes are integrated into this book, and then the... Second edition was A Beautiful Mind with the help of Ron Howard at getting to all these people, except for the actors. And Ron Mm -hmm. said, it doesn't matter what I do. Um, Russell Crowe and Jennifer Connelly are not going to talk to you. So there was so much (laughs) written online. So I got great material in there for them. Um, and, And it is interesting because 
it's not easy to get these interviews. And, um, but I mean, literally we did 70, we sat down with, I mean, I had lunch with Ron Howard. I went to Hans Zimmer's, um, stu- uh, music studio, who's the composer and was on the, actually on a set with the, com- uh, Bill Conti, the composer, when he was recording the music, he invited us to come <sighs> and listen to a recording session. So, and we were in Leonard Nimoy's home sipping cappuccino and Lawrence (laughs) Kasdan's home. And I mean, it was, it was just, you know, great. It's rough. It's tough. It's tough. It it was a tough game. It's really tough to sit with these people. (laughs) And um, so there were, there are some additions to those and uh, just lots of, lots of wonderful information in here that's really important to every artist because the actress should know what the editor is doing and the editor should know what the composer is going to do. But um, for the screenwriter, it's really important to know what people are going to do with your script and when what they're doing is fine and when what they're doing is you just cringe over that because you, you want great people working with it. Now, I mean, if you can imagine Steven Spielberg's work without John Williams or yes. without or without Janice Kaninsky as his cinematographer, I mean, or Kathleen Kennedy, or the Kathleen, I mean, the, yeah, yes. all, his amazing collaborators he has. I mean, everyone thinks yes. of Steven Spielberg as one of the greatest directors of all time, which he is, but without this group of people around him, I mean, he doesn't have that magic. You have to. It, it, it is such a collaborative art, and people always forget about that because of this theory, the auteur theory, which, you know, like the Kubricks of the world and, you know, uh, Billy Wilder and, and Orson Welles and these kind of older uh, filmmakers, uh, Alfred Hitchcock. But all yes. of these guys had such a coll- – I mean, they had collaborators for years. I know Ron Howard, he won't even move – on a movie unless his first AD is available. And he's worked on it. So like, if his first AD, like they will stop the, we can't, can't go until the first AD is available. Yes. And people um, like Spielberg or a lot of, a lot of these other people, Clint Eastwood uses mm-hmm. a lot of the same people, Spike Lee. They say, we have such a shorthand. It's yeah. just so relaxed and it's so much easier because you know where everybody is, you know that you can trust them. Um, and so more and more people have this group around them that, as you say, goes as far as the assistant director. And uh, I mean, Lawrence Kasdan did so many movies with Carol Littleton as the editor. Mm-hmm. You, so you, you just say, yeah, when you work well with people, you want to keep working with them. It's hard, it's hard to even find people you can work with in this business. And when you find them, you hold on tight. <laughs> Yes, yes, <laughs> that's that's the best. Now, and you you also mentioned something earlier that you know screenwriters should actually know what the editor and the, the DP and everyone else is doing. And I'm such a, pro, a proponent of educating yourself as much as humanly possible about the process. And so many times, specifically screenwriters, they'll just stay in their little screenwriting bubble and they just like, well, like I don't even know what a DP does, or I don't even know what the editor's doing. I'm like, if you you don't have to be an expert on any of those areas but do you agree that you should and every every person should know everything as much as they can about this process yes and one of the reasons to know so much is that you want the best people in each area to be attracted to your script and if you know how to write that script where the editor says i just love the way these scenes move one to the other i love how clear the narrative line is Uh, yes, I want to be part of that. Or the director loves the images or the producer says, you know, I think I can sell this. I think this is really commercial. It's got all the elements that we look for in a great film. So the more you can know about that, the better. And there is a saying, you can't use it if you don't know it. Mm -hmm. And so said, you never block out knowledge. You never limit yourself. And, um, Maybe on technical things, or I say I don't want to learn. <laughs> I don't want to learn that. But but you know when it comes to film or something like that, you really want to be open because it's amazing how many tools 
you will use that are in your toolbox. Now, if you're able to write, if you're able to write something like you're saying that, you know, can address an editor going, oh, I just love the way this is that or this is that, or the DP goes, oh, I love the images and what you could do with that. A lot of times those secondary and third layer of people, like the director will be maybe on the fence and he'll hand it to the editor. I'm like, what do you think? And that's the thing that puts it, puts it over the top. Is that, or the producer will do the same thing. Plus, these areas are so fascinating. Before we did the first edition of this book, I did a class in every area at UCLA. And so I took editing. I audited composing. <laughs> and I did, and I actually have had a background acting. So, but I took an acting weekend and I took uh, th- actually three film directing classes. And People said, are you interested in directing film? I said, no, I just want to understand that fo- that focus and that perception of the director. And I totally enjoyed all of these classes. They're just so fascinating to learn how all these different pieces fit together. And then talking to people who just, you know, really knew how to be interviewed and knew all this amazing information uh, um, you know, acting, how do you prepare for the acting part or mm-hmm. make up uh, another thing I found so interesting was the different personalities because the, uh, Ron Howard said the director gets to play with everybody. And so the director has to be kind of extroverted, but you think of the editor in the dark room editing and you think of the writer in the room by him, by him or herself, very solitary. So that's a different personality. Or the actor that has to relate so well to so many people. Um, the makeup people told me one of the things that they had to do is they said, we have to be able to move with all these different personalities because we are the first person the actor sees. And we have to help set the tone. If they want to talk, before they start shooting while having their makeup on, we will talk. And if they want to be quiet, we will be quiet. And we better be in a good mood because that's part of our job is to get that attitude going before you go on the set and have to do that hard work. That is what we like to call being professional. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Being a professional, which is unfortunately uh, lacking in many ways in the business so much. Well, in this business, there is a tendency to think that everyone can do everything. Right. Everyone thinks they can write and they can act and they can direct. And the composer said, we are the first artists where people will actually admit they can't do our work. That's actually true. And, That's- and they say in a lot of times that they will say to the composer something like, um, I want a motet here. And the composer will say, believe me, you do not want a motet here. Let me play you what a motet actually is. And one of the quotes in this book, which is so cute, is they said, so many people don't know how to talk to the composer. No. And someone says, you know, this this is a little too much like yellow sunshine. Could you make it more like a blue cloud? <laughs> It's like the composers say, I I guess so. I guess we can do that. (laughs) No, it's kind of like, because I've worked with many composers in my career, and it it, it is like I've, I've once or twice tried to talk in their talk, and I've been, and both times they're just like, you need to stop that. That is not your job. It is my job to do that. And all you got to tell me, and this is a great piece of advice for people working with a composer, is speak emotion. Speak emotion. Yes. What do you want to feel? I'll get, that's my, I'm the translator of from your emotion to the music. That's why you have me here. I think that was a great, great way of looking at it. Yes. And in that moment when composers say, I got it, you know, or I, I'm, they play a little tune and they said, that's it. Or they play a little tune and say, no, not even close. <laughs> <laughs> I, like I would love to sit in a room with John Williams and Steven Spielberg just for like 15 minutes to be a fly on that wall during oh, any yes. any of their sessions just to see what that – after so many decades and decades of making iconic things together, like what's that conversation like at this point? Yeah. One of the interesting things that I have in here is that when John Williams composed that five-note sequence in uh, the Close Encounters of the Third Kind, mm-hmm. he said – 
I sat down and I came up with 350 combinations of these five notes. And then Spielberg asked a mathematician, how many possible uh, combinations are there? And I think it was something like 34,000. And John Williams said, I think maybe among my 350, I can find (laughs) something, you know, the right kind of sound that I'm looking for. But isn't that amazing? And See, I think that's another great thing about professionals is that sometimes people think professionals, it's easier. I said, no, Prof- the difference between a professional and an amateur is the professional works harder. You, they, mm-hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. They, well, they keep working to get it right. And they have, they have trained themselves to sort of know that aha moment says, yes, okay, this is what I'm looking for. But, um, you know, screen professional screenwriters write a scene 22 times. And amateurs, after the third time, they think it's there and say, no, is that that's the difference between the two is you, you learn, okay, let me look at this again. I have a saying with the books I write, if I haven't written that sentence 10 times, it's probably not good enough. That's and, actually, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Is, and you just and you work on the wording and you work on the rhythm and you reverse the sentences and then you decide let's not do that here let's do this here and I mean just because uh, I I I'm a nonfiction writer because I do the screenwriting books and I do some books on spirituality and so in doing those I'm you know I'm doing the creative process of a writer I'm just doing it in the form of nonfiction as opposed to screenwriting. And it is interesting. I love working with ideas. I love writing books. And I have never had a desire to write screenplays. I love consulting on screenplays. I just just love the different subject matter I get and the different problems I encounter. So we all have that place where we have to figure out where we fit And what's nice about the collaborative art of filmmaking that if you want to be in the film industry, but you're not sure where you want to be, you read about all these artists and say, oh, I'm fascinated with editing. I never knew that. You know, I never did. So so the book will help you figure out where you fit. And if you're a new filmmaker doing low budget, the book will help you through those low budget films where you don't necessarily have all the people around you um, that that the expensive studio films might have. Now, real quickly, you were you were talking about professionals and amateurs, and I know amateurs a lot of times are people who are starting out when they're writing screenwriting when they're writing screenplays. Yeah. They get caught up so much in the in the the minutia of the period has to be here, that has to be there. All these rules in the formatting not even yes. structure or story just the formatting and it is important to format and like i always tell people i'm like when you're shane black they're gonna let a spelling error go by they're gonna let some grammatical stuff go by because you're shane black or you're aaron sorkin um yes. and that's gonna fly and you have to be so much more perfect when you're starting out but i think they get caught up so much i'm 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 excited when i started writing my screenplays i did the same thing i was just like literally periods and this and that what's your opinion on that Well, there's so many good formatting programs Mm -hmm. to help you. But if you're writing the first script, first script, it doesn't matter. (laughs) I I mean, you'll after you write it, you'll go and you'll reformat it. What you want to do is to start getting it down and have the experience of writing 100 pages. It's scary the first (laughs) time. I, um, I wrote my first book, Making a Good Script Great. I was terrified until the last chapter. And what I learned was you can type when you are terrified. Your your hands might be shaking, but you can still type. And pretty soon you take a deep breath and it's like, okay. And on many of my books, I've reached those points of sheer terror. I said, oh my gosh, I have to do this chapter or what am I talking about? And is this good enough? And then you go back into it and you get feedback. That's extremely important in writing. And you go through the process and, you know, somewhere around my sixth book, it occurred to me I was an author. I used to say, I write books. And someone said, you're an author. I said, oh, yes, I guess I'm an author. And and as you write, I mean, I feel like I have a handle on writing now. And um, it goes 
more easily in many ways because I don't get frustrated. I don't get upset if I'm running into a problem. I, I go for help. I go for feedback. I hire a researcher. I mean, I do whatever is needed in order to do it. But um, terror is part of it, and especially at the beginning, <laughs> and and knowing that you're having trouble with something. You say, I don't know how to do this. I had a literary consultant for my first seven books, and sometimes I needed him for the whole book. And so, so the first couple books he did, he worked on the whole book. And my editor at the publisher say, why are you having that? That's what I do. And I said, well, you actually do something somewhat different. And he helps me present to you a good draft so you don't have to do as much, but um, people have different talents. And then as I got more, you know, farther along, when I ran into problems, I would go back to him. And sometimes I'd go back to him with a page. And I, the one, my, one of my books is, he said, you know what, your, your actually first chapter actually starts on page two. Move that paragraph up, move these three paragraphs over here. Mm. I said, oh, that works really well, and I couldn't see it. So we need we need those people. Yeah, I, I understand your point of uh, after six books, you think of yourself as an author. I, I, it <laughs> took me a long time before I considered myself a director or I considered myself a writer of any sort. After after or even a podcaster at this point, like yes. <laughs> I, I guess I guess I'm a, like I literally turn people like, oh, you're a podcaster. I'm like, I, I guess after three four hundred episodes, I think I guess I am. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. And isn't it interesting how long it takes for us to acknowledge? Yeah. On the other hand, some people acknowledge it so fast that they say, I'm a writer, director, producer. And you say, what have you done? So well, I have a couple ideas. <laughs> So, no, <laughs> and a business card and a business card that quite yet <laughs> and they have a business card don't forget they have that yes, they have a business yes. card so that's all they need <laughs> yes <laughs> now i wanted to also because there's so i mean i could talk to you for hours so i'm going to try to get a little bit more in because i wanted to also touch on a few of your other books and some of these concepts in your other books uh, i was fascinated about the concept of um competitive being competitive against being collaborative you know, and there's so many, so many, not film, only filmmakers, but screenwriters out there who have this kind of dog eat dog mentality oh, yes. when they're trying to just like, I got to undercut that guy or that girl's going to, you know, I'm like, I mean, comp, like, I mean, competition with, with Aaron Sorkin. I'm like, no, you're not. So stop. Uh, <laughs> yes. you're, you're not. What, what do you have to say about that? What advice can you give screenwriters uh, and filmmakers who are this kind of dog eat dog competition? This competition? is an amazing collaborative business. And if you have that sense of competition, work at getting over it. Now, when I started, I had that sense. And any time someone came along or someone said, gee, they're just a great seminar leader. And I go, oh, oh, are they better than me? Or that was a great script consultant. And every time that happened, I just said, I don't want to do this. I do not want to spend my life feeling competitive with people. So I don't have competitors. I have colleagues. Mm -hmm. And we have worked really hard since I'd say the late 1980s to come together. So most of my colleagues, I know them. I have good relationships with them. Some of them I'm very dear friends with. But the thing when you're collaborative is that you feed each other, which simply opens up your business. So I endorse other people's books. They endorse my book. My um, certain colleagues get me jobs. I get them jobs. We, you know, we really, and we talk about things. Uh, sometimes we have to talk about uh, a contract. Sometimes we'll talk about maybe a problem we're having with a client. And you call and you say, how do I handle this? And, and I have, uh, I have, well, one of one of mine, when you know, if I ever get sort of caught up in that junky stuff, you know, that junky stuff that we sometimes get caught up in, <laughs> and Pamela J. Smith, who's a mythologist and script consultant, also she says, "Honey, don't get none of that on you," and she <laughs> sets me straight. And sometimes, you know, she'll say, "Leave this one alone," and other times she says, "No, this has to be addressed." And let's work together on the email or how we're going to address this because it's it's important for the industry to address 
certain things. So I think that's another thing. I have what I call my confidants. And when I'm not sure about something, I say, okay, how do I handle this? I, I don't think I'm – either I'm not handling it well or I have a feeling I'm not going to handle it well unless I talk to you. So we need – we really need each other, and that begins to feed everything out and ripple outwards. I wrote a book about this. It's an um, it's not a screenwriting book, it is, but it's called The Better Way to Be- Win – the better way to win, connecting, not competing for success. Mm-hmm. And I did it as a master's degree in a, I have an MA in feminist theology among <laughs> these other degrees. And so I was interested, how do you move from one model of thinking to another when you've grown up and thinking of other people in your field as competition? And, and it took me a long time to get over that. But the, my intention was, I do not want to live my life this way. It just eats you away and, you know, you can't appreciate other people and well, you're like, who's number one in the world? Oh, forget it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, don't just, you... Mm-hmm. But don't you agree that I mean I, I always because I, I and even in my world where I'm online being an online influencer if you will in the filmmaking and screenwriting space with indie film hustle and bulletproof screenplay I get I get comp- uh, colleagues of mine who are also in this space who think of me a lot of times as co- as competition and I always tell people I I don't have competition because there is nobody that can compete with me because it's like me it's like me trying to compete with Chris Nolan like. Yeah. Chris Nolan You're is Chris yourself. Nolan. I, 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 he has a flavor in his movies. I have a flavor in mine. Uh, you know, maybe that's not a good example because he's at a different level no. than I am. But no, but just even colleagues, it's like there's only one Linda Seeger. Like, you know, yeah. there's a Michael Haig, there's a Chris Vogler, there's a John Truby. You know, all these guys have very different flavors and are presenting ideas just in their own, through their own filter. And it's just, you can't really compete at that point. And some people because like, you- yeah, go ahead. Yeah, because you want to be authentic, not only as a human being, but in your work. And you say, my work is an expression of me. And so there isn't anyone else that does things the way that I do it. Um, But I have teamed up. I even do team consulting at times where uh, just recently someone had a very mythic oriented script. And so I did my work and then they went to Pamela Smith and she did their, her mythology work on it. And then Pamela and I had a phone conversation to just make sure we were in tune because we said we don't want to contradict each other. We want to expand on each other. Um, and, you know, it's so much fun to work with good colleagues. Mm-hmm. So we used to be part of a screenwriting summit where it was Sid Field and Chris Vogler and John Truby and Michael Haig and me. <laughs> and we went to... Tel Aviv, we went to Mexico City together, we went to Toronto, you know, just various places. And we had such a good time together. And it was such a wonderful way to get to know each other in a much better way. And so we feel I think we all felt very warmly toward each other. And um, we feel very supportive of each other. And, And what a what a joy. I mean, we're we're supposed to have fun in our work. We're supposed to enjoy what we do and enjoy the people around us. And who wants to go around every day feeling miserable and competitive with a pit in your stomach? That's not a good way to live. <laughs> so I don't want to live that way. So we, and, and there are people, of course, that will be competitive sure. and that will not be as close to you. And you think, well, I just don't want to rile them up. I always want to be respectful and kind. And regardless of what they do, I don't, um, one of the things I had was I don't want to give other people a reason to have trouble with me because I don't want to cause anyone trouble. I want people um, you know, I mean, I want everyone to be happy and fulfilled. <laughs> you know, I, that's my goal in life. Is <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it makes life a lot easier. We're here for a short time on this on this rock. I mean, it should be yeah. – it, it, we should have some fun while we're here, and, and that kind of energy is excellent. One thing you also mentioned I want to touch upon is mindset. I'm a very big proponent of mindset and, and how it, it literally can crucify us and, and stop us from doing anything – 
uh, and and also opens up doors and and accelerates your your cre- not only creative process but your life in general. Yes. What is your you've worked with probably thousands of screenwriters now in yes. the course of your career. I'm assuming you've run into some interesting mindsets along the way, whether it be <laughs> yes. at the very high levels of Oscar winning screenwriters to the the amateur just starting out. What are some of the biggest obstacles you see that screenwriters put in front of themselves to stop them? And, and I'm sure you've met super talented yes. screenwriters who are just like, yes. why aren't you doing more? Why stop thinking that way? What are some of those things? Yeah. Well, one thing is people who don't want to learn mm-hmm. and they really think that they know everything, in which case there's no reason for them to come to me. <laughs> but uh, sometimes they do anyway. I think they hope I'm going to write 20 pages about how wonderful they are and say, so you're going no matter what, you're going to get a critique. I mean, that's what I do. But um, I think that's the hardest thing is people who push things away that can help them and say, you know, I I or people like me are not there to tell them what to do. We're there to show them how they can get more out of their script. And, And we don't just say, well, do the scene this way. We say, look, you want more movement in this scene or, you know, we talk conceptually. So I think there's there's. Um, kind of the sense about everyone being open. Uh, another thing, and, and I say this in a lot of my seminars, say learn to say yes instead of no. Now, have your characters say yes because no stops the story and yes opens it up. So if the guy says to the girl, you want to go out with me Saturday night to dinner, and she says no, we don't have a story. <laughs> and... When I'm invited to places, I I just generally say yes a lot. Now, I don't say yes to dangerous situations, but I'm going to be going and teaching in nine countries this this fall. So I've been saying yes to Kazakhstan and to Kiev and to Warsaw and Latvia and all this. Um, But I also, now in my case, I also check things out in terms of the safety side. And I did say no to Tehran. I said no to Kurdistan. I said no to Nigeria. <laughs> as as you should, as you I, should at this yeah, point. And I, I have a group of consultants. I Actually, they're made up of generals and colonels who know the world. And I say, is Latvia safe? They say, yeah, but don't go to Russia right now. Or don't go to Tehran right now. And so I, I, I take them more seriously than the State Department. So, But one of the things I found in my seminars last fall, so many people came up to me after and said, that is such a great concept for life, is to say yes. And what I see is screenwriters sabotaging their careers. So somebody says, you know, we'd like you to write the script, but we don't have much money. And I say, oh, no, I don't want to do it. <laughs> it's their first opportunity. Said so your first opportunity, you say yes. I mean, you want to keep the ripple effect going. And if you don't say yes, you have no narrative line about you as a screenwriter. So, um, you know, later down the line, you're going to say no to some stuff and yes to others. But um, even in my work now, I generally don't say no to things because I, I want things to keep opening up. And um, so, you know, I, as I say, I have the whole spectrum of writers. And sometimes people say, well, do you only work with studio films? I say, no, of course not. I work with people just have to contact me. <laughs> exactly. And I think there was a book by Shonda Rhimes, uh, The Year of Saying Yes, where she literally oh, said neat. yes. She literally said yes to everything. And she's like, I'm going to do an experiment and anything that I I get asked, no one knew that she was doing this, but for a year she said yes to everything. And she she said her world changed. Oh yeah. Because her opportunities just opened up and she just started going to places and doing things that she would have never done because of her own mindsets or because of her own things that she said no to. So, And I think the other thing is look for places where you can be kind and generous Mm. and that there's a lot of time. I mean, when, if people email me, I, I do try to respond. I mean, I, I don't necessarily respond with a four-page email, but <laughs> I, I do try to recognize, you know, people are reaching out for help. And I think sometimes you see people in this industry who just are not generous. And then you see the people who are. And um, 
uh, one of the loveliest things I heard was I, I have a friend who's um, has produced and put together some very, very big film festivals. And she says, you know, one of the nicest guys I ever met was Liam Neeson. He got off the plane. He says, what can I do to help you? She says, oh, my gosh, isn't that the nicest things versus someone getting off the plane with their entourage and their stuck up nose and, um, you know, do this, do that. And so uh, I think all of all of us, and it doesn't matter where we are in the world, is to say, I, you know, I'm here. I want to I, I want to do good things. And my sense is we it's kind of like writing. If somebody says, why do you write? So you, you, the only reason to write is to change the world as we know it. Mm-hmm. No, <laughs> so, no, no, without, we, without question. Yeah. So, <laughs> Do you believe also, I mean, and I have to believe at this point that you, ha- you would agree with what I'm about to say, but I- I've discovered it recently in the last few years is once you become of service to other people in whatever shape that might be, it might be something small, it might be something big. The world changes for you and opportunities open up, the doors open. And I can't even tell you how many opportunities have presented me because of me being of service to a community of filmmakers and screenwriters out there. I get that. I literally get to sit down and have a conversation with a legend like yourself and have this connection that, you know, if I would have called you, if I would just drop an email to you, I'm like, hey, can I just talk to you for an hour and a half? Probably not going to happen. <laughs> but, do, but do you agree that just being of service really does open up a lot of opportunities with, with people in, in their lives yes. and their careers? And you have to believe that things ripple out in that even when they don't come back to you directly, mm-hmm. they come back indirectly. And so you want to keep the ripple, you know, you want to keep that ripple going. Now, you also you also have written you know many books on screenwriting, but you've also re- written books on spirituality. And yeah. I know when some, sometimes when you say that word, I know right now the second I said the word spirituality, I know if I, at least twenty thirty percent of the audience just said, "Wait a minute, what's going on?" I, whoa, everyone, calm down. Uh, <laughs> my audience is a little used to me talking about a little deeper subjects. I wanted to touch a touch upon. Uh, not only spirituality, but, you know, because obviously you have a very unique pedigree with writing and theology uh, and, and where you come from. In, in regards to spirituality, in regards to um, your own journey in life as a creative, let's say, let's stay with a creative and a screenwriting. Yes, yes. How can that that concept of spirituality, whether you believe it or not, I always like, I, I use the term universe a lot. It's like the universe does this and the energies of coming in and out. What is your advice to screenwriters um, and filmmakers, for that matter, in regards to getting in touch with themselves? You know, I meditate a lot and I, I, I teach meditation yes, yeah. and I wanted to kind of bring that to my audience as well. And it's done so much for me. What do you what are your feelings on this? Well, I wrote a book called Spiritual Steps on the Road to Success. And the subtitle is Gaining the Goal Without Losing Your Soul. <laughs> and what interested me was the spiritual issues that go along with success. And I was mainly interested uh, because as I moved from failure (laughs) and things not working for years to becoming successful, I realized the issues become very different. And I think it's really easy when you get successful, you think you don't need to be spiritual anymore because you have everything you were praying about before. Of course, why? And (laughs) and what I discovered was just a whole new set of issues. And so I got interested in those issues, although the book begins with a chapter on what it means to feel called and all you know or guided or say the way you opened up or I just found my way and I love what I'm doing or you know however you define it and so the first chapter is about that but then as it moves on it talks about some of the other issues and they and I, I think there is a commitment when when I started out I, I kind of made a commitment that I would try to do my business with spiritual principles and with spirituality. And I figured uh, that I sort of figured I would make it. I didn't expect to do really well, but I said, you know, I don't think I'm going to fall through the cracks. Now there were times I did think I was going to fall through the cracks, but, and 
What I discovered instead was, I mean, things have gone far bigger and better than I had expected when I started out. But I think I was willing when I started out to say, I just want to actualize myself. I, I want to use my talents. I want to nurture people's creativity. And so then things open up. And then not saying no to how they open up, because we often put those gates down. Like I saw myself, oh, I bet all the studios are going to hire me. And <laughs> won't that be great? And I'll get my names in the paper and maybe get thanked for an Academy Award. Well, that's not how my career went. I do work with experienced writers, but the studios don't hire people like me. And what I realized was where the path is evolving, that's the path you walk down. And you don't just say, oh, I'm sorry if I, I have to put my nose in the air. <laughs> and so there, there is a lot about moving down and then realizing the issues you have to deal with change. And I don't think in anything we do things alone. I think our lives are collaborative. And that means if you need a therapist, go to a therapist. When I was starting my business, I went to the Jung Center in Los Angeles, and they had a sliding scale, and I was at the bottom of it because I had no money. Mm -hmm. And But I worked with a Jungian, as Carl Jung, Jungian therapist for really several years and it really helped because every time an issue came up in my business, I had some place to go. Um, I work with a spiritual director at times, and I'm going on this long trip for two months teaching in nine countries. And when I taught and was gone for two months last fall, I worked with her throughout the summer. And I really think I'm going to go back because I think I want to be ready for the opportunities, the challenges of that much travel meeting lots of people, um, you know, wanting to make sure I don't get too tired, I can't get sick. You know, there's a, because people say, oh, that's so glamorous. And you say, yeah, it's, it's I, I mean, it's, it's wonderful for people who love to travel, which I do. But there's a lot of challenges. Mm -hmm. And saying, I'm going to be in 10 countries in two months. That's a lot. And you know, I, I expect everything will be fine, but I don't know what Kazakhstan is like. <laughs> you know? and this, so time, this time of the, year, I, who knows? Yeah, I mean. <laughs> and, and so, you know, you really try to cover everything and say, and the generals told me, they said, uh, don't go out in the countries in, in you know, any of these more unusual um, places, but the city will be safe and it'll be fine. And when I went to Columbia, that's what they said. Do not go in the country, but stay in the city and always have someone with you from that country. And so, you know, we will do that and follow safety procedures. But I was told, no, they said, you are fine in Kazakhstan. You should not have any trouble. And we approve your trip to Kazakhstan. <laughs> so, um, you know, so, so there's... I think keeping in touch, and I think the other thing is centering down, like when you're working on a screenplay or you're writing, is there's times you just have to take a breath and kind of sit with something. And I, when I write my books, there are times I will reread a chapter and I say, it's not good enough. It's not deep enough. It's not saying anything new. It's not emotional. And I sit down and I say, let me get into my gut. What is it I want to say that maybe somebody hasn't said before? And how do I get in touch with that and then have the courage to say it and, and you know, to be upright? But uh, there is another thing I have noticed um, in my writing. I have been more willing to do personal stories and also to be funny. Mm -hmm. And um, I will say there's even in the, we're writing a book on dialogue and my assistant does some of my typing and I do some of the dictating and we'll just sit here. We'll say, that is so funny. I hope my <laughs> readers just burst out laughing when they read that paragraph. So letting all those different parts of you out and saying, yeah, you, you, sometimes you have to sit down and, Think about what what do I have to say that's fresh and new? And if I don't have anything to say, well, you know, there's other jobs you can get. Now, I mean, do you agree that 
um, a lot of a lot of screenwriters specifically will go into this business for first of all thinking they're going to be rich and famous, which <laughs> yes. generally any. generally speaking, not not the greatest business plan yeah. I've ever heard of in my life. Yes. <laughs> but if you're going into uh, into screenwriting and you're writing and you're putting all your energy in things, thinking of the market only, and only mm-hmm. thinking of making money or getting out there, that generally. It doesn't work often. You know, it's a lottery right. ticket. If it, they're outliers that have that works, but anytime I've heard of anyone writing something that really came from inside, really with yes. something personal, in touch with something else that no, a story that no one else can t- tell, or a, a, a message that really resonates within a fictional story that comes from you, and and you open yourself up and are exposing your your soft underbelly, if you will. Yes, that is yes. where the that's where the magic is, isn't it? That's where the stuff is, right? Yes, yes. Is to pull it out and not be thinking about the market down the road. You know, say your tenth or fifteenth script, mm-hmm. you might develop that sense of a, a more of a commercial sense as Fine. you go along, mm-hmm. or you have an idea that someone doesn't think is commercial, and you say, "How do I make this resonate with other people?" And you work on it and you get feedback from other people and they say, I'm I'm really bored the first 15 pages. But then you get into something really interesting. Say, oh, that's where I need to go. I need to build up on that. And so you do think, you know, I mean, I get feedback when I write a book. I usually have six or eight readers give me feedback. Mm-hmm. And then I eventually have the editor, of course. But I wouldn't. I I can't imagine turning a book into some uh, to even to a publisher, even after all these books, without having readers that are going to give me feedback and say, "Yeah, this is fascinating," or "I don't understand this part," or "This is repetitive," or um, and I mean, you want to get the filters, so you know, I I. Sometimes I just pour a lot of things out and have other people help me filter it through. So there's a balance on anything, you know, even a balance on the humor. Yeah, no, without question. And but even with those commercial projects, you know, some a lot of times the writer needs to dig deep to even make so yes. something like a beautiful mind. Oh you, yes, uh, the, you know, I forgot who the writer was. That go, uh, who was yeah, that? Yeah, Kiva Goldsman. Ki- yeah, Kiva Goldsman. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He, I'm sure, when he was writing that story there was something deep in him that he put on yes. that paper through through that amazing story. And then Ron and Mr. Howard actually took it to another place and his team but, did. But, but Akiva had to really work to get that job because he was known sort of the Batman stuff and mm-hmm. that kind of very entertaining thing. But he grew up in a house that brought in autistic children. And so his mother was a psychologist and he knew he had something to offer and he went after that. He was not on the short list of possible mm-hmm. writers, but he heard about this and he went and he just pitched his, his heart out. And he also took that chance of making that jump into more serious work in the same way that Steven Spielberg did it with Color Purple. Mm-hmm. And I have so much respect for people who take that chance. Think about Sally Field from The Flying Nun to Sybil or Farrah Fawcett Majors, you know, that made that jump and um, a number of actors. Oh, Robin, Robin Williams, Jim Carrey. Yeah, yeah. D- Dead Poets Society. You say that it is so risky and it's so easy to not do that. And it's very, di- it's, it's very difficult because you have a, a built-in audience on one area and then you make a jump into another. So when I started doing some spiritual books, everyone thought, well, you're, you're nuts. <laughs> but I mean, I have a doctorate and I have a, two master's degrees in theology and in focusing mainly on religion and the arts. But I thought, I really want to, I have some things to say in this mm-hmm. subject and I have the background to be able to say things. But, um, you know, making that leap, you don't have a built-in audience. And people say, well, I know you one way. I don't want to know you the other way. Oh, yeah. And so your heart has to guide you and say it's not an easy path. 
Yeah, to either, either yeah, it's like, look, I'm going this direction as an artist and as a, as a, a soul and a human being in this world. If you guys want to come along with me, great, but I'm going down this path. And if you don't, yeah. that's fine too. I'll come back yes. and do something that you might like again, but this is where I yeah, have to which go. Which is to- why my my website has the writing part, and then you can click on the spirituality part <laughs> if you so choose, and you don't have to choose that. <laughs> exactly. Now, you also touched upon something earlier, and this is another one of your great books uh, about subtext. Yes, writing subtext. Subtext is such an art form. Mm, uh, yes. and, and it's something that so many early uh, or young screenwriters will just write on the nose dialogue and on the nose like scenes. And subtext is what makes, honestly, I think what makes a good script great. Uh, it sings. Ma- yeah. yeah. So what are some advice or some tips you could give us about writing good subtext? Well, one of the things is you want to start tuning into the subtext in your life. And when this was an assignment. Michael Weezy said, we'd really like to have a book on subtext. Would you like to write it? And I thought, oh, that sounds interesting, but I don't, I, I haven't thought about this. And so I started by tuning in, where do I see subtext? Where have I seen it in my past? Where where do people say things where I think, I wonder what that really means? Mm-hmm. You know, when the, when the guy says, I'll call you, and as you leave <laughs> when you've just met him, you say, I wonder what that means. Now, if he calls me tomorrow, I'll know what it means. But if he doesn't, is he dead? Did he go to prison? Did he get in an accident? Or wasn't he really interested in that? It was just a line. So you... You, you know, or when you say, how does this look on me? And person says, fine, it looks fine. <laughs> and he's like, um, now you don't think I look too fat? No, it's, it's okay. <laughs> he's like, I don't think I'm going to buy this because that's not, there's something going on here that I don't quite interpret. And one of the things with subtext, when you come across it, you usually don't know what it means. Mm -hmm. And so going into that, and then what I found when I wrote that book is I thought, what are the movies where I absolutely know there's a lot of subtext? And one was Ordinary People and one was Hitchcock's Shadow of Doubt. Mm. And so I studied those and I began to look for the patterns where am I seeing subtext? How is this similar to this? Oh, I see. Subtext can be in words. It can be in gestures. It can be in action. It can even be in the genre. And so I began to see all the different layers of that. Um, and I had to. I kind of had to learn how to talk about this because there wasn't another book on subtext out there. I there were a few books that maybe had a section. I don't even think a chapter. I think more Mm -hmm. like a mention. Mm -hmm. And um, since then, I think there's just been maybe three books Mm -hmm. since then. And then we're writing a book on dialogue. So there, I I actually was working this morning on the chapter on subtext, which will go in and trying to make sure I didn't say the same thing I said in the subtext (laughs) book. And so, so far, so far I haven't. So far so good. (laughs) Yeah, so. But uh, yeah, on the but on the nose dialogue is one of the biggest notes I've ever seen coming back from from screenwriters. It's just like I am going to walk over there, yes. uh, or you know, or, or or let's not even talk about um, putting in a history uh, of a character. Like yes. you know, like when or you let's were beaten. Do a flashback. Yeah, to show that they had a terrible childhood. You know, like no. when your when your dad no. beat you. Like no, look, look, you yeah. need to be much more. And I always, I'm very keen of that when I watch a movie now. How they slip in that kind of um, what's the word? It's it's free. I'm I'm completely losing. It's like it. a resonance, you know. It's yeah. Or, or the little comment or this thing you say. Oh, that either means the opposite, or it carries layers of meaning. And that means that the writer needs to really love words and say, that's not the right word. It doesn't have the right resonance. It's like when you sing, there's a thing called the the overtones. um, And you say it's that extra ring, almost like you almost hear that octave above or the octave below. And you say, that's what we're looking for, or, you know, marine biology, the undertow. I say, we're looking for the undertow oh, nice. that you see something and you sense that underneath, you know, what lies beneath. And so, and that takes a lot of work from the writer because usually the first, 
the second draft is going to be more on the nose. Mm -hmm. And then you start working to say, I, I want to get, it's, it's just too flat. It's too obvious. Right. So, and now and what is one it? Of the, okay. Well, I was just going to say one of the things that I love about the book, I'm, I'm co-writing the dialogue book with John Winston Rainey and the end, we're having a case study where we take a little section of, of a client's script with their permission, and then we do notes on it, and John does a rewrite, and a lot of the notes are, okay, we want a resonance here. We want to get, get a little deeper with what we're doing, and so people can actually see how do you rewrite dialogue? How do you think through it to make it richer? Now, what is a, uh, if you, if, I'm sure you have a, at least an example. Is there a scene in, in film history that just like, oh, that's really great subtext, just so that you see people really understand? Yeah. Well, there's, there's a scene in, um, there's a scene in, well, I'll tell you what, what might be really famous. The photography scene in Ordinary People, mm -hmm. it's around Christmas, and the father is trying to take a picture of the mother and the son, Conrad, and, um, and the son and the mother, the son really is uncomfortable with the mother. And he keeps crossing his arms and turning his back. And they're, they want to get the two of them together. We'll show how, you know, get it together. And he doesn't want to. And, and they're having all sorts of trouble getting the camera to work. I mean, it's just absolutely saturated with you say, oh, my gosh, this family is so problematical. And all they want is everything to be normal. And this this is not normal. This is they're struggling so hard to be normal. And the therapist says, you know, normal is not all as cracked up to be. <laughs> and, but but I, I would look and look at ordinary people. It's just filled. It's it was um, uh, gosh. <laughs> Uh, anyway, it's it's is it was written by Alvin Sargent, yeah. and Alvin and I have a little email relationship, and we've occasionally met when we're in LA for breakfast. He's absolutely adorable. He's had one of the longest histories of a screenwriter, way back Paper Moon and all that, up to Spider Man Two. Um, wow! <laughs> just uh, he's 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 an amazing writer, and he's the most. I, I actually think he's the most adorable man I've ever met. <laughs> it's, like, it's like I do, and, and I write him, and I I tell him that, you know. And then he says, "Aren't you a beauty?" <laughs> so, so we have just the sweetest little emails at times back and forth. Now you also talk a lot about in your work uh, the rewriting process and how yes. how just in, insanely important is the rewriting process like you were saying earlier a professional rewrites it 22 times the amateur will write it two or three times like oh it's good we're good yeah what are some methods that screenwriters can do in the rewriting pro in rewriting process to make it more effective in their work well the the first thing is you, you is that it's really good for you to get it out so don't do too much evaluation too early mm -hmm. in the process you don't want the mother to come in and nag at you when you've just written the. <laughs> Say that's not good. So you, there's times you just have to get it out. And what I do is when I'm not sure about a, a word or a phrase, I put brackets around it. And I might write it three different ways. And then I let it sit. And I might sit there for a month until I say, oh, wait, now, now it's clear about how I do it. But the first rewrite is really you going back to what you've rewritten. And I suggest you circle what is good. Don't, don't get upset with what's bad. You might only find three lines or three sections that are good. Great. That's, that's your guide for the rest. And then you rewrite and then you start getting feedback. And sometimes I think it's good to be in a writer's group if the writer's group is positive and to, you know, you have your group of friends, other writers that you send it to listen to their feedback, but that doesn't mean you have to follow it. It just means listen. And then down the road, you might want to go to a script consultant, or if you don't have that group of friends who are writers who can give you initial feedback, then you can go to a script consultant earlier. Mm -hmm. But, but, I mean, this idea of getting the help along the line and training yourself to say, I am willing to go back into this 
this is flat. Now, I'm going to have to think a bit about what I want to do about it. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, I know this is where I want to approach it. And this is, and um, in some ways, it's a little bit like practicing anything. I, I've gone back to piano in the last two years. It's like, I get up in the morning and there's three measures that are really, really hard. I get up in the morning and I play them three times before I start my day. And you know what? They sound a whole lot better now than two months ago. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing as you get up in the morning and you say, right now, I'm only going to work with these five sentences or this scene. And I'm not going to start with page one. I'm going to go in. What are those places I have to tussle with that I know aren't working? And you just, you know, break it up and you say, this is, this is the process. It's, it's the process of every single artist is you get it down to its smaller parts. You go back to the bigger parts. You get to the smaller, you go to the bigger. And um, it's, it's something, you know, you, you just learn a lot is this is the art process and don't resist it. Just mm -hmm. recognize this is it. And it's a, it's a tightening. It's just tightening everything up. Strengthening, tightening, broadening, yeah. deepening. Yeah, all those <laughs> are great words. All, all those are great yes. words. Yes. Um, and in your opinion, I think you were the best person to answer this question. What makes a good writer great? Well, they need to have it, – it's, it's a combination of art and craft. And so your art is your voice. That somebody should be uh, – sometimes people say – I can look at a movie and maybe I didn't see the credits and maybe I didn't see who wrote it. I look and you, you know, it's a Woody Allen movie. Mm -hmm. Woody Allen has a very clear artistic voice or you look at Oliver Stone. Oh, that's gotta be all an Oliver Stone movie. Mm -hmm. Very <laughs> and much so. so. And so whatever that voice is, and it might take a number of scripts to find your voice and affirm your voice because sometimes people are really comedic and they're not taking advantage of that. And um, so you're saying, what, it, what makes up my voice? And how do I accentuate that and balance that? And then you need to know the craft. So you're putting your voice and your specific ideas together with, I know the three-act structure. I know how to express my theme. I know what visuals mean and how to create metaphors cinematically and I know how to round out my characters. I know how to make my characters more dimensional. I know when I'm hitting a cliche, I'm going to fix that. So you just keep learning about all these elements. And you learn, I learn a lot from other movies at this point. So sometimes I'll watch a movie and say, oh, I hadn't thought of that. Like um, Crash, mm -hmm. 14 plot lines all Oof. intersecting Oof. at the second turning point, like what's going on here? And I, bro I, I wrote a book called And the Best Screenplay Goes To, and I analyzed Crash, Shakespeare in Love and Sideways, three mm -hmm. very different movies. I spent 70 pages on each of them, interviewed the directors and the writers of both of all of them. And you begin to, um, you know, you say, these are learning movies. These are so you find those movies where you say, I can learn a lot from watching this movie a number of times. And, um, you know, so I mean, I have favorite learning movies. I love As Good As It Gets. And you, oh, love you, that movie. You know, you quoted from that one and <laughs> say, Oh my gosh, you just watch that movie over and over again and you keep understanding dialogue, transformational arcs, relationships character contrast I mean, you just you learn so much and the willingness to do a line that leaves you breathless that line when um jack nicholson's character says you make me want to be a better man oh. and you just go oh my goodness is and what a deep line somebody had you know um james brooks and mark andres had to go deep inside themselves to find that ability for that kind of character to have made that kind of breakthrough to actually be kind and let 
some of that inner side out. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, I, was, I was I was on a plane the other day and I had to I watched Jerry Maguire again. I hadn't seen it oh, in yes. years. What a I just oh yes. and when he's when he says you complete me at the end or you, yes. you had or you had me at hello. Yes. It's so cliche now, but even still, it still has that impact and and it's still so powerful. And that's one of those lines. In a movie. I mean, yeah, it's quoted, it you know, capitalizes. It, it capitalizes it completely. That one line says everything you need to know about the movie. Yes. Without question. And the ability of the writer to write that line says you had to go to a good deep place to write that line. But you also psychologically as a screenwriter have to be willing to, to go that deep, to kind of go maybe to places that you might not want to go to, to, yes. to pull that out because there are, if I may use uh, Joseph Campbell, the treasure that you seek is – uh, in the in the uh, cave that you are afraid to go into. Yes, yeah, and but, to say I, I have to keep, you know, moving in that in that direction. It's the, it's yeah. yeah, it is it is it is a it's a very fascinating fascinating process, the screenwriting yes, yes. process and the filmmaking and, process in general. Yeah, now I'm going to ask you. you okay. Oh, I was just going to say, and you need to know a lot of psychology to get into the different characters. And I think you need to be very careful in certain subject matters. Some people say tread very carefully if you decide you're going to deal with evil people. Mm. And, you know, and actors, I know actors who have said, I'm not going to do those kind of characters anymore because they inhabit me and I inhabit them. And it's hard to get rid of them after. And I have to go into that place and do I really yeah. want to do that for the next year or four years of my life or whatever? It, it, I'm not talking about the perfect goody two-shoes characters, but um, you do have to be careful about taking serious subjects too lightly. Well, I mean, well, perfect, so perfect example just to, to, to follow up on that. I always tell people <clears throat> when I see someone who's quote-unquote evil or bad, it's just, it is perspective because yes. – from the perspective of Hannibal Lecter, he's good. He's the right. hero. He's the hero of his own journey. You know, yes. he doesn't go like, you know, twisting the mustache going, ah, ha, 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 ha. Yes. You know, and that's where all bad people or evil people, it is all about perspective. And I think the best villains in, in, in they all have this kind of, in their perspective, they're doing good. If there's multi-layered like I'm doing something bad according to other places, but I'm doing it for a good reason. Like you know, just perfect example is um, Thanos in Avengers. Uh, this last this last Avengers movies, he wants to destroy half of the universe, but his perspective is it's like, look, you're overpopulated. This is just what I'm going to do. <laughs> so there, I mean, it's weird, but it's a it's a way of his. It's a perspective. Would you agree? Yeah, and there's also a lot of times insecurity behind it, mm -hmm. a really bad backstory. <laughs> the, I mean, a lot of things to explore about what's really going on inside that person. What are they grappling with? What are their temptations that they have to give into? What are their obsessions? Because they don't have the good and the light to illuminate the way or to you know help them take another path. And so... You are you are in the grasp of mm -hmm. of evil uh, too. Yeah, without question. Now I'm going to ask you the last few questions. I ask all of my guests, Linda. I could talk to you for at least another four or five hours, but I, <laughs> I, I want to respect your time. Um, now, what advice would you give a screenwriter wanting to break into the business today? Well, the 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 thing is, you have to eventually know marketing, and you have to eventually look for opportunities to, to be able to either sell your script or to get an assignment to to do a script. Um, but I think know a lot, and then get into organizations. I mean, depending where you live, if if you have a women in film near you and men can join women in film now, or you have a cinema arts organization or any kind of a, you know, screenwriting groups or whatever, get involved because it has been proven that people who are in a community of some sort or collaborative in some sort do better. You have those people who say to you, I'm, let me, um, you know, yes, I have an agent or let me refer you to whatever that might be. So 
get in, get involved and learn and try to get inside the business to some extent. If somebody says you want to come to the set, say yes, because the experience <laughs> of being on a set and seeing what happens and all the waiting and all the cables that get moved around, but just to, to see what that is like is a really terrific experience to have. So you're trying to broaden your experience to understand this and you're trying to uh, build relationships. You want to be very careful about using people mm. that you meet. But on the other hand, you know, if you have an opportunity, have your 20 second elevator pitch ready. You get in the elevator with Steven Spielberg for some reason, he's going to the 12th floor. You better push the 12th floor button to <laughs> say, I have 12 floors to say, I'm writing a story about a Jaws that <laughs> about a shark that threatens the 4th of uh, uh, sound and the 4th of July weekend. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, uh, take the elevator with me. I want to talk to you. So and then be prepared. That was the other thing. Be prepared. So when somebody says, I love your idea, do you have a script? It's a good idea to have the script. Mm -hmm. Or if you have a new idea, can I see some of your writing? Have some writing that you've really gotten as good as it can get because you don't want to be caught when you finally have an opportunity and you're not ready to take it. Would you would you believe that Steven Spielberg must be terrified of going into elevators by himself yes. at this point in his career? <laughs> Especially after I said that, if he hears the podcast, nah. says, no. You're not I'm the first. Press the second floor. You're honestly, I've had so many different, uh, you know, uh, people on the show talking about pitching, and they, they always use Steven Spielberg in an elevator as an example. Yes, yes. It's just <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, Steven. Yeah, <laughs> the urban myth, or something like that. I mean, it's insane. And uh, okay, so can you tell me what book had the biggest impact on your life or career? You mean somebody else's book? Yes. Oh, oh. Probably The Power of Positive Thinking mm, by uh, way, uh, Norman Vincent Peale way back. You know, I was ready to go to college. I had read, I had read that. Great. And, and maybe it had an influence because one of the questions on the application was, what books have you read in the last six months outside of classes? And I probably had one of the best book lists. I had The Making of the President, 1960. I had East of Eden. I had The Power of Positive Thinking. I had just a lot of great books on, on what I had been reading. So yeah. maybe it got me into college. <laughs> That's well. great. That's a great book, by the way. Yeah. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Oh, I think the biggest lesson was learning that this that life is collaborative. I entered this business thinking you're self-made and you just, you know, you do it yourself. You never ask questions. You pretend to know everything. And it became clear that was not a good idea. And I literally spent about a year learning to change my thinking. And it, and what was interesting was I had spent years, probably 14 years of living on the edge. And once I changed my thinking, I found success within a year. So that change of thinking is really important. You know, mindset. It's, it's mindset. a better mindset. way to win, <laughs> connecting, not competing for success. <laughs> and the toughest question of all, three of your favorite films of all time. Um, Amadeus oh, is, is undoubtedly one. It, I call it the big gem. Uh -huh. uh, people always know I'm going to mention Witness. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> yes. and one of the reasons, I'm a Quaker, and although we're not Amish, people sometimes mistake Amish and Quaker. And my husband proposed to me during the barn raising scene of Witness. It was not an exact proposal, but it was it was a, a sort of proposal. And um, then the, the real one came a little later. So, of course... It, it's very special. And then I knew uh, I knew Bill Kelly um, and Pamela Wallace. Um, Bill Kelly has died. I talked to Earl Wallace once, but I didn't know him. But Bill and I occasionally had lunch together. Pamela and I had, have team talk together, and she's endorsed a few of my books. So that's special. But now you want a third one. I guess probably Tootsie. Oh, great. Oh, what just an amazing three-book movies. Yeah. Okay. I love Tootsie. It's such a yeah. – oh. And see these in these films, when you find a favorite film, it really stands up 
So you watch it over and over and Mm -hmm. over. And you say, you know, I don't get tired of this film. I, right. Even when I know the dialogue, even when I know oh. the dialogue and know what they're going to say is just you keep getting the nuances and say, what a brilliant piece of filmmaking. Yeah, just My, so mine's is always, I hope and everyone listening to the show knows what I'm about to say, Shawshank Redemption, which I think is one of oh, the most yeah, perfect films movie. ever, ever, yeah. ever written, put together, everything. It's fantastic. <laughs> and finally, where can people find you, your work, your books, everything that Linda well, has to offer? Yes. Well, if you know my my name, Linda Sager, and think of Sager like Bob Sager, S-E-G-E-R, my website is lindasager.com. My email is linda at lindasager.com. You're gonna, going to easily, easily find me. And I'm on YouTube and I have, you know, I mean, just... A lot of things and, and you can find some really interesting things on youtube of me that are unexpected like me horseback riding to music you can even <laughs> find that on youtube <laughs> so, so. linda on, honestly you are a national treasure in the world oh. of screenwriting so thank you so so much like i said i can literally talk to you for at least another four or five hours comfortably and i think everybody would be entertained listening yes and but, i love talking to you so you know we can do this again this has uh, been great Thank you so much again. And I, I, again, thank you for dropping some amazing knowledge bombs on the, on the tribe today. So I truly appreciate it. Good. Thank you. I want to thank Linda so much for her time and coming by the show and dropping major, major, major knowledge bombs on the tribe today. So Linda, thank you. Thank you so much. If you want to get links to any of Linda's work, her consulting, uh, her website, anything, just head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 315 and it'll be links to everything and anything that Linda does. So thanks again, Linda. And guys, today is the day, my screening at the Chinese theater of my new film on the corner of Ego and Desire, plus a talk and book signing of my new book, Shooting for the Mob, is happening today. For tickets, just head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash screening, and I hope to see you guys there. Thank you again so, so much for the support. And that's the end of another episode of the Indie Film Hustle podcast and the Bulletproof Screenplay podcast. As always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenplay podcast at BulletproofScreenplay.com. That's B-U-L-L-E-T-P-R-O-O-F-S-C-R-E-N-P-L-A-Y.com. Geico presents yet another voicemail from your roommate. About the kitchen. Turns out when there's a grease fire, you're not supposed to throw water on it. <laughs> Who would have known, right? Anyways, the fire department is here and it's totally cool. Give me a call back when you get a chance. The Geico Insurance Agency could help keep your personal property protected. Like if danger is your roommate's middle name. Visit Geico.com to see how easy it is to switch and save on renter's insurance. The House of Roll journeys far and wide to bring you exceptional quality kitchen and bath fixtures. In all of this, you'll see the details of your own story. The story of a life well-crafted. Welcome to the House of Roll.